Welcome back, everybody. This is now the second to last uh, class of the semester. And uh, yeah, after going through all sorts of interesting stuff about you know our own solar system, I wanted to have at least one uh, class that sort of puts the sun in a, in a, in a larger, uh, larger context of other stars. So we can talk about exocoronae, exowinds, and their impact on exoplanets. Um, uh, again, this is going to be another whirlwind tour, so I, I apologize to, for going through a lot of stuff very fast, but again, I just, the, the point of this is to sort of introduce you to all the different things that are out there, and we can always uh, talk in the Slack or somewhere else um, about some of the details if we want to go back to them. Um, yeah. So, you know, we can talk a little bit about the sun and its connection to the other stars. There's a lot of thoughts that people have had over the years. Um, most of the hour, I think, will be on number two here. You know, different types of observations of stellar activity that are analogs of solar activity. I'll talk a little bit about models and simulations. That could probably, probably be another hour's class itself and also uh, impacts on actual other planets and a little a bit of some other, other you know, aspects of heliophysics that have influenced astrophysics in some other ways. Um, yeah, I just sort of put together some, some general thoughts about you know, the sun. And it, a while ago, I found a very nice little uh, quote by Clarence Chant, a very dapper looking fellow from the 1930s, who mentioned that our sun is of superlative importance for two reasons. One, because it's the central body and ruler of our system. And two, because it is one of the stars being the only one which is near enough for detailed study. And what we learn about it will help us to solve the problem of the universe around us. And I can't think of a better summary of the solar stellar connection. Um, but of course, as we've gone through the decades, there have been problems in trying to mesh together our knowledge that we get of stars and the sun because the measurement techniques are so different, the observations are so different, um, and that has guided sort of two separate communities. So trying to bring them together, I think, is a, is a very useful thing. Um, so is the sun a typical star? Can we use it as representative? Um, the sun has been called sort of mediocre and run of the mill. Um, in terms of its mass, it is kind of something like in the median of the distribution, right? If you look at the so-called initial mass function, I found this cartoonified version on Twitter um, that basically shows that, you know, the, the actual distribution function of the formation of new stars in our galaxy has a, you know, there's a probability distribution and the peak is somewhere around 0.5 solar masses, but the median, since it's asymmetric, the median is probably more closer to the sun's mass. So it's sort of the most probable value that you might find. Um, and also in terms of being in the middle, its age is also in the middle, right? It's about 4.6 years old. And the, the main sequence lifetime is something like 10 billion years old. So maybe there's, there's some sort of anthropic reason why we're here at that median time. Uh, if you want to go down an inner rabbit hole, there's this thing called the Lindy effect where you can use to um, estimate how long something will last based on how long it has existed. And this sort of median time is, is thought to be typical. But yeah, I guess sort of that means we can sort of feel somewhat safe in, in thinking of the sun as a representative example. But of course, in order to do that, we really want to look at other stars, other examples. Um, I'm hearing something from somebody who might not have their mute. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm just showing a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram here. I'm sure you've seen these before for stars, luminosity versus uh, effective temperature of the surface increasing from right to left. This is just something I put together for, for another purpose where I actually wanted to explore the, the outliers, right? What are the hottest possible stars? What are the brightest possible stars? How far does the, the, the cloud of points go in all the different directions? Um, 
So it's not really a representative statistical sample in this, in this diagram. I just wanted to see how far everything goes. And indeed, as you go all the way down to the lower right, those are the brown dwarfs. And all the way down to the extreme lower right is that little beige dot. That's actually Jupiter. So I really wanted to take it all the way down to something like the, uh, the, the, the planetary scale. Um, and also on there, of course, the sun is the, is the yellow dot at, at the current stage. The red is the future, the expected future evolutionary track of the sun as it first goes up to become a red giant, and then it sloughs off those outer layers as a planetary nebula, and then swings all the way around to a very hot and dense uh, white dwarf. And of course, these points down here are the are the other observed white dwarfs as they cool down. Um, yeah, again, I just wanted to sort of put the sun in its in its uh, perspective that way. Uh, but there are better versions of this if you want to do sort of a statistical, statistically complete sample. Uh, there are there are different ways of doing it than than this. Um, yeah, so so maybe we shouldn't emphasize the outliers if we're just looking at typical values. So maybe let's look at typical uh, different types of stellar activity: rotation rates, photospheric granulation, magnetic fields, chromospheres, and coronas. That's a that's a big one, and also the properties of their stellar winds. So we can start with rotation. Uh, I've got another scatter plot here of, of all many different thousands of stars plotted on one plot. The rotation period is the y-axis. And again, like an, like an HR diagram, the temperature goes from right to left. The sun is up here at a period of 25 or so days in terms of sidereal period and our, our effective temperature. And it's right in the middle of this black blob of tens of thousands of points of other stars that mostly have been measured by looking at very precise uh, light curves and basically looking at star spots going around and using those to, to tease out what the actual rotation period is. Um, we can see a feature that has been known since the 1960s from Bob Kraft that as you go just a few thousand degrees hotter than the sun, the typical rotation period gets much, much faster. The rotation period drops precipitously. This is called the craft break. And we think it has something to do with the fact that um, cool stars like the sun have stellar winds that, that take, out, take away angular momentum and slow them down. And the hot, these, these hotter stars here uh, tend to not have such strong, you know, uh, convectively driven, uh, whoops, coronal heating and winds. Um, yeah, I'm also plotting the, the critical rotation period, which should be a lower limit to this thing, right? That's when you're, it's rotating so fast that gravity is balanced by the centrifugal force. If you tried to rotate faster, the outer layers of the equatorial regions would be ejected into a, you know, a ring or a, or a decretion disk, the opposite of an accretion disk. Um, there are some stars observed to be lower than that, but this red curve is just for sort of typical parameters and uh, other stars can have other parameters. And also, of course, there are, uh, there are measurement uncertainties. Yeah, there's a lot that could be said about uh, a, a diagram like this. And we'll come back to the, uh, the, the reason for this craft break uh, in a little bit. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to illustrate some of these uh, light, these, these light curves that, that give us the rotation periods. There's a whole zoo of different types of shapes that can that can happen due to you know a single large spot or several large spots at di spots at different longitudes. Sometimes there's no no appreciable uh, pattern at all. Um, so sometimes it's say for red giants, it's very hard to measure rotation rates. Um, yeah, there's a whole zoo of different things. When when we have more than just a light curve, when we have spectroscopy of a rotating star with spots, we can actually make maps of the star spots, at least an, a blurry maps that, that aren't you know super precise. But the fact that we have spectral lines that are broadened by the actual rotation, and you know there's one end of the star that's coming towards you and one end that's moving away from you, and those different longitudes have different Doppler shifts. So basically, you can tell by by how bright or dark the different parts of the spectral line are. Um, you can tell where the bright and dark features are and watch them sort of march across the disk from the from the blue side to the red side as it goes towards you, then away from you. And you can use tomographic techniques to do reproduce these, these kinds of maps. 
Uh, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. And you know, there's a there's a fundamental limitation for the accuracy of, of these maps uh, because again, you're just looking at one point of light and teasing out things just in one dimension. Um, yeah, the, the other aspect of rotation that's that's important to talk about is the correlation between the rotation rate of a star and its age. This is called gyrochronology. It was sort of kicked off by Skumanich in 1972, who found a trend, essentially, as stars get older, they tend to be uh, spinning more slowly. So the angular rotation rate goes down as one over the square root of the age. And there was just recently a conference here in Boulder just, just a month or two ago that celebrated the, the 50th anniversary of these, these relations. Um, yeah, and all, uh, there's been a lot of other recent data that upholds this, this sort of law for main sequence stars. But as you start to go to the youngest stars, only a few million years old before they reach the main sequence, the measured rotation rates sort of fan out in an envelope. There's not just one trend anymore. There's a whole diversity of different possible rotation rates um, and generally large compared to the current solar rotation rate um, for very young stars. And there's a lot of you know, work that's going into trying to understand these envelopes. But generally, one shouldn't be too surprised that the youngest stars are very rapid rotators because when stars are born, there's a huge amount of angular momentum that's in that parent molecular cloud. And as it collapses down to a star, only a small fraction of that reaches the star itself. And in fact, this is why young stars have accretion disks, because a lot of that material stays in orbit for a long time, because it's got such a large angular momentum, it, it can't, you know, it can't, you know, collapse all the way down to, to the, to the eventual size of the star. Um, so yeah, they're, in general, these young stars are very fast rotators. Um, okay, the, the second aspect of observations I wanted to talk about are, is granulation. And if you haven't seen much of this, you might be surprised that we might be able to actually detect granulation on other stars because on the sun, it's such a tiny, tiny phenomenon, right? I think this, this diagram is to scale here along with the size of the earth for comparison um, to show that the granules are very, very small. And you might think that because there are so many granules that are all sort of incoherent and out of phase with each other on the surface of the sun, how would you ever be able to see that there's some defect by just looking at, say, the light curve of, of the sun? Well, we can be more quantitative about it, right? We can look, we can say, we can estimate the number of granules that exist at any one time on the disk of the sun. Um, and that is something like 2 million, basically comparing the the area of the disk and the area of the uh, of one granule, you get about two million. The intensity contrast between one granule and its dark lanes is something like two percent in terms of the white light intensity. And you know, again, it, it seems very very tough to try to understand how two million of these things all oscillating out of phase with one another incoherently um, could whoops could do that, but you get something like 2% divided by the square root of n, if it's Poisson statistics, and you get about 15 parts per million of an RMS variability, but there are precise measurements of stellar light curves that go down to that level of precision. The Kepler Space Telescope did that for many thousands of stars. And yeah, Kepler measured called flicker amplitude for something like 17,000 stars. Um, and I just wanted to sort of crow about Sam Guten's thesis research from last year, where he modeled what was going on using convection simulations. Here's some of the data. It's again sort of an HR diagram, but using the effective gravity of the star as this luminosity-like axis. But again, there's the main sequence down here and the red giant branch going up. The sun is down here in this sort of blue region. And yeah, the, 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 the flicker is something like 15, 10, between 10 and 20 parts per million, typical for other stars like the sun as well. Uh, the, the, the very low gravity giants have much larger flicker, mainly because they have larger granules and fewer granules on the surface. So dividing by that square root of n doesn't reduce it as much. Um, Sam's models actually did a great job. And this, pic, this uh, plot here shows the observed divided by the modeled flicker. And one is this sort of gray in between. And 
in general, the, the model did a great job. The caveat, of course, with this is that when you use convection simulations to try to figure out how much flicker there ought to be, there are different steps involved. And one of them, for example, is to take the actual convective Mach number that you can get out of a stellar model and from that compute the temperature fluctuation from which you can get the intensity fluctuation. Turns out that there's a spread in the prediction of different simulations. So what we're doing here is basically computing it for the, for the high end, computing it for the low end, and if the observed flicker falls in between, that's when we're calling it one and making it gray here. So this is an optimistic plot, but again, it's saying that, that the, the observations definitely fall into this range of the, uh, of the spread of the models. Now, why is there a spread? That's a question for another day. Um, yes. Okay, other observations of stellar activity. Of course, we can measure stellar magnetic fields using the Zeeman and Hanley effects from spectropolarimetry. Um, and you can also do this Doppler trick with rapidly rotating stars to make actual physical maps using tomographic reconstructions of the magnetic fields. And you can make vector map, you know, 3D you know, vector maps of the, uh, of the vector magnetic field using the I, Q, U, and V Stokes vectors as they vary across the surface of a star. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a neat trick that can be done for a lot of, a lot of different stars. And you can monitor stars over months and years and decades. And we have actually started to see hints of decadal type activity cycles in their magnetic fields. Polarity flips over, over decades as well. And I'll show some of, the, some of, the, uh, some of that data in a little bit. Um, in general, though, one of the simplest things to do is just to look at the overall strength of the magnetic field as a function of, say, the stellar parameters, say, the rotation period on the, on the, on the x-axis and the mass of the star on the y-axis. In general, we see stronger fields, which are larger symbols in a plot like this, uh, for, for shorter rotation periods. Um, it's not an exact left to right correlation. It's more of a lower left to upper right correlation. And in general, as I'll show in a second, these, these curves that, that, that are constant values of the so-called Rossby number are a useful way of characterizing these data. Don't worry too much about the colors and the shapes. They give us information that you get from these Zeeman Doppler images about the uh, about the, uh, the, the, the the actual vector nature of the magnetic fields. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of work being done trying to compare dynamo simulations with, with these types of plots. Um, but yeah, this Rossby number was, was pointed out by Bob Noyes in the 1980s as a, as a much more useful parameter that helps organize the, organize the data rather than just having sort of uh, scatter plots, basically these tighten up the scatter plots to to, uh, to uh, much tighter correlates. Uh, it's essentially taking the rotation period and dividing it by the convective overturning uh, time scale for stars of a given, for stars of different masses. So basically this lets us compare, you know, stars like the sun and M dwarfs, the apples by this sort of dimensionless ratio rather than just looking at overall time scales in, in days. Um, if we wanted to look at the magnetic field and also compare apples to apples for different types of stars, we can compare the measured magnetic field with something called an equipartition field strength. You know, we know that, that, that magnetic fields exert a, a pressure and gas exerts a pressure. And from the measurements of the stellar spectra, you can, you can, you can figure out what the gas pressure in the photosphere is. And if those two pressures were equal, you can compute a magnetic field strength that is usually, uh, for the sun, it's something like 1500 Gauss. So it's sort of on the high side. It's sort of around the, the, the vicinity of the maximum field strengths that you see on the sun. So what you can do is measure, take the measured field strength, divide it by the equal partition field strength. This is often called the filling factor of strong fields. So very, very active stars have filling factors of order one. The sun has, is, is a very low activity star compared to many others. So it's got a filling factor of you know, less than a percent to just a few percent. And it varies up and down as the solar cycle uh, goes from min to max. Um, and yeah, we can look at, at these different things. We can look at the magnetic field strength versus Rossby number, or we can look at this filling factor versus Rossby number. 
kind of similar for magnetic fields. Um, and we generally see that for the more rapidly rotating stars, which are the shorter periods, so smaller Rossby numbers, we see sort of a saturation, you see a flattening of this trend, which sort of, which the, the filling factor curve tells us that we've reached one, right? It's kind of hard to go very far above one in terms of filling factor because the entire star is sort of fully covered in fields that are roughly speaking as strong as they can get. Uh, the, the less active, more slowly rotating stars have a decreasing trend. and The sun is sort of down here with that purple strut. And yeah, these, these types of, you know, power laws and combined with flattening when it saturates are very important constraints to, to convective dynamo type, type models. Whoops. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, the other aspect of stellar magnetic fields, I mentioned the decade scale cycles that have now been measured for many stars. Here they are, right? The, the, the x-axis is the rotation period of different types of stars, of different spectral types with the colors. And the y-axis is the cycle period in years. So some of these stars have been measured for, you know, 30, 40 years to be able to detect periods, uh, cycle periods like this. And what bohm vitense and, and others have, have noticed is when you look at a plot like this, there seem to be two tracks, right? There's this upper track, there's this lower track. And well, the first thing you wanna know is where's the sun? And the big surprise from bohm vitense's paper in 2007 was that the sun falls right in the middle. Um, so maybe the sun isn't a typical solar type star um, because it's falling in the middle. In recent years, Travis Metcalf and Jen Van Saters have, have done some more work, added more points to this plot. Their complete version of the plot is here. Their idea is that the typical evolution of a star as it spins down, basically all stars are moving from left to right as they spin down, but there's a point in the star's evolution where the dynamo sort of cools off and, and you know, goes from a very short period to a long period. So as, they, as, a, as, as a star cools down, it'll reach a point where then it evolves straight up. It, it evolves from the short cycle period branch to the long cycle period branch. And the idea is that the sun might be in the middle of that transition right now. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work trying to add more points to this plot to try to try to make sense of, of models like that. All right, I guess we can finally come to the to the to the main observations of stellar activity, the actual measurements of a stellar chromosphere and a corona. And there are all, there are a whole host of uh, correlations between the things that we've already talked about and the actual, you know, photon emission, you know, x-rays, UV, radio emission. Stuff like Kevin France's group is measuring for a lot of stars, especially in the EUV. Um, and then chromospheric diagnostics, like what we, we can get from spectral lines. Um, yeah, again, there's a whole history in Boulder of, of measuring these things, also over many decades, to look for cycles in, in these diagnostics. Um, and as I'll show, many of these correlations look like those other plots versus Rossby number. Right? There's a saturated region, and then there's a power law decrease. And in those power law unsaturated regions, you can that there have been many attempts to try to compare the power laws to one another. This is the this is the realm of the, the Skumanich spin down law as a, as you know rotation versus age. You can look at the magnetic flux measured on the surface as a function of rotation rate. Another power law, like X-ray luminosity versus magnetic flux. Another power law, and you can intercombine these things to look at how they 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 scale with one another. Um, yeah, these plots versus Rossby number, as I said, look very much like the, the magnetic field ones, rapid rotators, saturated, and then transitioning to a, to a power law like decrease. The one for x-rays is really kind of beautiful that it just almost looks like, yeah, two, two, in a log log plot, it looks like two straight lines, uh, connecting these two different regions. Um, yeah, so that's the general idea for the overall sort of time averaged uh, measure, measures of the strength of the chromosphere and the corona. Um, when you look at stars as a function of their evolution in the HR diagram, um, here's, a, here's another HR diagram. And again, you ignore, the, uh, ignore the, the colors of the symbols. Basically all these stars have measured activity in, in one, type of or, one type or another. 
but, and the sun is down here on the main sequence, this gray is the main sequence, so stars evolve up and to the right. And what Linsky and Heche realized in the 1970s is that stars below a certain threshold, they, they mapped out a dividing line, and this, uh, this uh, yellow region is my own attempt to sort of update that, um, is essentially a region where there are coronas, and then for the giant, for the red giants, above a certain uh, you know, point in their evolution, there are no coronas. There, there are no X-rays. There are no, you know, there, there's no strong UV emission. It's very hard to find the, the, the presence of a corona. They do have extended chromospheres, but not extended coronas. Um, in the 80s, people discovered a sort of a series of hybrid stars in between, so-called hybrid chromosphere stars. Also, Tom Ayers here in Boulder is studying a lot of this, what he calls the coronal graveyard right here in this transition region between coronas and not coronas. There are some stars that have sort of hints of a corona, even though they might be on the wrong side of the dividing line. But yeah, in general, they evolve from having a corona to not having a corona. And of course, definitely as you go to the more massive stars to the left in this diagram, there's also a drop off in coronal activity. We think we understand that one pretty clearly because once you get to stars hotter than about 6,500 to 7,000 Kelvin, there's no subsurface convection anymore below the photosphere. And whoops, that convection is what's thought to really provide that kinetic energy for the coronal heating. Um, oh yeah, and before I move off of chromospheres and coronas, we can't forget flares and spe specifically the super flares that are seen on many other stars. Um, the plot down here shows the flare energy versus the inferred uh, size of the emitting region on the star. I'm not quite sure how they do that for other stars. Uh, this is a paper from Yuta Notsu. And you know, down here are the, are the solar flares that we observe all the way up to you know, X10 or X, maybe even X100 for the Carrington event. And way up here, at much larger energies are the inferred energies for the for the stellar flares that we see as in, you know very large uh, increases spikes in the total star averaged white light intensity from these light curves. So very very energetic, and yeah, it, it's hard to even think about how to bridge the gap between these two. You know, there there's probably some detection biases going on because you could never see a lot of these dim things on the other stars when you're integrating over the entire disk. Um, but it's certainly also the case that we never see anything this uh, energetic for the sun, right? If you were to go up to this upper edge of this plot of just a few times 10 to the 36 ergs, that's equivalent to taking the entire luminosity of the sun and you know expressing it as a flare that might last for 10 minutes. You know, Luminosity is ergs per second multiplied by that time and you get that kind of energy. And, that's really not what we see for, for solar type flares. So yeah, these things are, are a very different type of animal. Um, but I wanted to mention them and there's still a lot of, of interesting modeling that's going on. The final observational thing is mass loss, the actual presence of a stellar wind, stellar outflow. Um, and that's generally something that's hard to measure, right? It's, it's often stated here that, as I say here, that the only reason we know there's a solar wind is because we're in it, right? We, we, we learned about it when we started sending spacecraft out beyond the, the, the Earth's magnetosphere, and we could detect it, you know, directly. But if all we had was, you know, if we were looking at the sun from parsecs away, it would be very difficult to tell that it actually had an outflow. Um, so astronomers have been trying to, to figure out detection methods for, for winds of other stars. For high mass loss rates, there's a spectroscopic technique that's pretty clever, that's been suspected to be a diagnostic of winds for about 100 years or so, and I think is pretty now confirmed to be. Um, it's basically looking for spectral lines that are where their opacity is dominated by scattering so that when you look at a star and the, and the atoms are, are leaving the star, the photons are also leaving the star. And when they encounter those atoms, some of them get scattered into our line of sight, but there's a geometry effect because some of the photons that get scattered into our line of sight that are in the column in front of the star, right? Here we are looking at a star and you know the photons that come out and then get scattered into our line of sight that are 
you know, seen in projection against the bright star um, are going to form absorption lines. And because the wind is coming towards us, um, the, the, that absorption will be blue shifted. But there are also other, you know, photons that are being emitted off to the side. And if they're scattered in some random direction, some of them are going to be scattered back into our line of sight. And the Doppler shifts there are a combination of projected, projected components towards us, projected components of zero transverse to us, and projected components away. And because these aren't in, these photons aren't seen in projection against a bright source, they're seen as emission lines. So the sum of these two different types of photons makes this purple curve here, this very asymmetric red shifted emission and blue shifted absorption. This is called a P-Signy type line profile. It's been seen for many decades and it's named after the star, the, the luminous blue variable star with a very strong wind. Uh, where it was first uh, detected back in the 1920s, I think. Uh, but yeah, this whoops, this is a very uh, a very uh, good way of detecting the properties of a stellar wind. There are many others, and I apologize for plopping them all on the same uh, same uh, uh, slide here. Right, there are some other types of P-Signy profiles you can see, say, in the optical. Uh, there are continuum diagnostics in the infrared and radio. Um, where the wind is this, you know, cloud of plasma that's expanding outward surrounding the star, and that produces its own, its own uh, continuum spectrum that if it's cooler, say, you, you, you'll see it at lower, you know, more, more radio type frequencies uh, over and above the stellar spectrum. Um, one, of the, one of the most recent methods in, the, in recent decades has been developed by Brian Wood and Jeff Linsky. Um, and it's been used to detect solar wind level mass loss rates, very, very weak winds. They basically look at the Lyman alpha line of neutral hydrogen, which is often very absorbed by the interstellar medium. So basically, here's the sun, here's another star, and we're looking along the line of sight. Most of these central parts of this Lyman alpha have been absorbed by the intervening gas in the interstellar medium, the intervening hydrogen. But if you look along the path, you know, the sun is surrounded by a, you know, the solar wind, the termination shock, the, the heliopause, and, you know, the, the helio sheath. And if this other star is surrounded by something similar, there's going to be some extra pile up of hydrogen on the outside there, some extra pile up of hydrogen on the outside of the sun. And the, the, the wings of this absorbed profile, um, one, one side of it gives you information about the, 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 the piled up hydrogen uh, uh, around the other star's astrosphere. And on the one side, it gives us information about the sun's heliosphere. And we can, we can actually get a relative measure of the amount of mass loss from that star by comparing the amount of hydrogen on both sides with what we see from the sun. Um, yeah, yeah, there's this deuterium on the, on the blue wing here that helps us actually figure out what the original profile would have had to have been. So it's a very subtle and, and maybe a bit model dependent uh, uh, detection of these mass loss rates. But I think it's, it's been improving over the past couple of decades. Um, so yeah, so, well, what do we get when we look at different stars? Here are mass loss rates of observed stellar winds. What I've plotted here is as a function of stellar luminosity. And you can see sort of that's the generic, that's the overall organizing parameter, I think. Um, also luminosity is an interesting parameter because stars are also losing mass for another completely different reason. They're not losing mass due to winds, they're losing mass because they're undergoing fusion. They're turning hydrogen into helium and some of that mass of the four hydrogens is being converted into energy before it turns into a helium nucleus. And the luminosity of the star is the energy loss due to that process, but you can also express it as a, as a you know, D mass over D time. And that's what this dashed line gets. And it's kind of an interesting coincidence that uh, the, the, the observed loss of stellar winds by you know, evaporating off the surface is, a, is sort of following the same sort of trend as what's happening deep in the core of the star. I don't think there's a huge uh, 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 cause and effect relationship here, other than the fact that 
the more, most luminous stars do have a lot of energy available in those outer layers to power whatever is driving the wind away. So maybe that luminosity correlation is just due to the fact that there's available energy in the outer layers uh, in order to do that. Interestingly, the sun's solar wind is kind of puny. It's even below the, the dashed line, and there aren't that many th that are below. And the ones below about 10 to the minus 14 here in this lower left, these are the ones that have been detected by this, this astrosphere technique. Um, I didn't put error bars on these, but oftentimes the error bars are, you know, an order of magnitude or two <laughs> in terms of in terms of their size here. So yeah, there's there's still a lot to do to make these measurements more precise, but but uh, this is what we have. Um, another way to plot this is again going back to that HR diagram. Now I can show you what the actual colors mean. The colors are the mass loss rates of winds as measured. Whoops. Um, and yeah, again, it's mainly organized by luminosity going from bottom to top, but there are some other trends as a function of other stellar parameters too. There are some outliers, right, in, in regions where they shouldn't be in terms of just luminosity. And, and I can show you a, a model soon that, that tries, to, tries to explain that as, uh, uh, on the basis of different rotation rates of these, of these stars. Uh, okay, now we're going from observations to models. Uh, we're, we're way more than halfway through the class, and I didn't want to spend too much time on models. So there's really just a, a few things that I, I've sort of highlighted. One is this idea of the, the, the Skumanich relationship, this rotational spin down over time. How do stars lose angular momentum? And essentially, why do the cool stars lose much more of it than the hot stars do to, to form this craft break? And this has to do with the stellar winds carrying away material, and they're carrying away angular momentum with it, right? The angular momentum of a rotating star is, you know, the mass proportional to the mass times the square of the radius times the angular rotation rate, right? It's the, the moment of inertia times the, the angular rotation rate. And if something's varying in time and that the star isn't, isn't evolving too much in radius over a given time, um, it's mainly the loss of mass that's causing a loss of angular momentum. So for a star like the sun, you could, you could, you could plug in some numbers here. If you were to do that, you would actually not get enough loss of angular momentum, right? If you take this scaling law, it only accounts for something like 1% of the actual, sorry, the actual angular momentum loss that we infer is happening from this Skumanich, uh, uh, you know, omega going as, one over square root of age. Um, the solution to that uh, was, I think, pointed out by Weber and Davis, who found that it's the magnetic fields that actually uh, increase the lever arm and increase the amount of torque that's carried by this entire system. You know, it's not just the star itself that's carrying the angular momentum. If there's a magnetic field that forces all the plasma in the corona and the wind to, to co-rotate uh, uh, far above the surface, that actually produces a, 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 like I said here, a bigger lever arm, a bigger amount of torque that allows more of it to be removed by the wind, right? So instead of omega times the stellar radius squared, it's omega times the alphane radius of the, of the wind uh, squared. And that's usually at, you know, a dozen uh, solar radii above the surface. So squaring it, you can get a few hundred times what you get from the simpler model. And that seems to produce what we actually see, at least for the, uh, for the main sequence stars. Um, yeah, as far as coronal heating models for other stars and models of stellar winds, I sort of think they're in the same ballpark as coronal heating models and, and solar wind models for the sun. Um, there are a lot of theoretical ideas out there, a lot of you know, simulation codes that are Im implementing those ideas. Um, but really, we still don't have a way to discriminate between the different proposed theories. I mean, the only other thing I'm going to give you here is a result from a paper I wrote with Steve Saar uh, more than 10 years ago now. This is, again, the HR diagram where the, where the point colors are the stellar wind mass loss rate measured on the left. And for stars near the sun on the main sequence and in the red giant branch, uh, we have a model that that implemented things like MHD turbulence uh, 
and you know the balance between you know conductive and radiative losses and all the different heating and cooling rates to uh, to try to figure out what is the base pressure um, in the in the open field corona and that helps you determine the mass loss rate and it, it we think it did a pretty good job it, it required the input of the the rotation rates right we had to use something like um, I won't go all the way back but you know when when we plotted the the uh, magnetic filling factor versus Rossby number. Uh, there were these curves on there. We basically had to use one of those curves as a as a calibrator to figure out how much uh, how much magnetic activity there is for a given rotation rate. But it seems to work pretty well. Um, yeah, more information on that if 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 desired. I did want to make sure we didn't leave before talking about the impacts on exoplanets, right? All the space weather effects we've talked about ought to be happening in these other solar systems too. Um, a lot of what happens to the Earth depends on the magnetosphere. We actually don't have unambiguous detections of exoplanet magnetospheres yet. Um, just this past December, there was a paper and press release about an indirect detection of what I think they were calling an extended, you know, plasma sphere and magneto tail that you can sort of map out by looking at the uh, at the uh, at the extended transit in different lines, and you can see the shape of the thing as it goes across the surface. Um, but there were no actual planetary magnetic fields detected from from this 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 one exoplanet. So I still think of it as an indirect detection. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different pieces of information, uh, evidence put forward. So maybe this is a, you know, if it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. But again, it's not a direction of the actual magnetic field of the planet. And I think the only way that, that we're going to have to do that is in the radio, right? Planetary magnetospheres can, be, can, um, can exhibit this sort of electron cyclotron maser emission that I think has been very firmly detected for you know, the gas giants in our solar system. Um, I'm not sure how, whoops, I'm not sure whether it's been measured for the Earth or not. Um, for other exoplanets, it's currently too weak, too weak to detect, but new missions might do it. Whoops, ah, why is it keep doing that? Um, there's been a lot of thoughts about how to design those missions to optimize for those measurements. Um, yeah, now, of course, planets with magnetospheres aren't the only planets. Uh, there are right here, right here in our solar system, planets like Venus and Mars that don't have large scale global magnetic shields like the Earth does. Um, you know, say on Mars, the, uh, the, uh, the solar wind and you know, magnetic variations from CMEs kind of get much closer to the surface of the planet and produce an induced ionosphere and an, an induced magnetosphere that can sometimes be enhanced by you know little pockets of magnetism say on mars um but because it gets much closer to the planet and really digs into the atmosphere this you know it's really thought that the uh, the, the solar wind had a big role in actually removing mars's primordial atmosphere that was you know initially much you know warmer and denser than it is now um and there's been a lot of models of the young solar, both the young solar wind and the much higher levels of EUV and X-ray flux impacting the uh, the atmosphere that sort of blow it all away. Um, so yeah, that seems like a, a plausible history for Mars um, and the loss of its initial atmosphere. Um, yeah, if you look at all the different exo, this is from the uh, Astro 2020 Decadal Survey of you know 4,000 uh, uh, exoplanets. Um, but if you look at them as a function of the semi-major axis from their star, right? There are the close-in exoplanets, but they never get closer than about 0.01 astronomical units. And it's been suggested that that inner boundary, that you, the fact that you don't see planets closer than that, there's there's an even you know stronger version of the ablation rather than just ablating away the atmosphere. Once you get that close, it ablates away the entire planet and destroys them on a very short time scale. So I think the the uh, Lammer and others have been trying to model the the existence of this boundary line in 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 terms of distance from the star, closer than which you don't see uh, you don't see any planets, and that has to do again with you know the more extreme versions of space weather you would see very very close to the to the star. Um, 
yeah, the only other impact on exoplanets that I wanted to mention is uh, is the the past of the Earth, right? The past is a foreign country, and the 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 ages of the Earth uh, going all the way back 4.6 billion years represent another interesting test case of a very sort of exotic other type of planet. Um, and what we can, when we look back in the past, there's this thing called the faint young sun paradox, right? Um, if you've heard of it, you, you, you've probably heard that there's geological evidence for the young earth being warm enough for there to be liquid water on the surface going very, very far back. But when you look at the evolution of the solar luminosity, it was much lower back then. Um, the astronomical evidence basically says that if the Earth's atmosphere was the same as it was then, the equilibrium temperature would be below freezing. So there's a there's a paradox there. Carl Sagan and others, you know, first you know popularized it in the 70s, and the evidence for this early warm wet period really is not going away. Um, it's still a paradox. There have been many possible solutions, many proposed answers to it. Um, there are astronomers who have been looking at basically saying maybe the sun's mass loss rate was much, much higher uh, in the past. And the more massive young sun would have had a higher luminosity and that would have allowed liquid water. This is something I'm a bit skeptical about. I, I've, I've, I've tried to work out some of the details it turns out that I think you would need the sun to be about 7% more massive when it was born than it is now for this to work. And there's really no way for the young solar wind or even the young CMEs, which would have been very, uh, very uh, massive to, to remove 7% of the sun's mass. It just doesn't seem to work. Um, I think the most likely uh, scenario is that there was a there were there was a lot more greenhouse gases, a lot more CO two and 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 water vapor on the young Earth, and uh, that was the idea that I think would would keep it warm. Uh, there's some other ideas about about lower albedo due to fewer clouds, but that doesn't seem to work with the the more greenhouse gases. Uh, there was a space weather explan uh, explanation by Vlad Arpitian. Basically, he looked at the stronger flux of solar energetic particles coming towards the Earth and looked at the upper atmosphere chemistry that those SEPs would, would initiate when they you know, blasted molecules apart. It turns out that the, the chemical reaction chains might end up with a lot more uh, uh, nitrogen, you know, nitrogen oxide, N2O, and that is a greenhouse gas that might also keep keep everything warm on the earth. A recent idea was, has been looking at the effects of the moon, right? When the, when the, when the, when the moon, you know, billions of years ago, the moon was much closer to the earth. There were much stronger tides that caused a lot more frictional heating inside the earth, probably caused a lot more volcanism in those early days. And maybe that extra heating also kept the, kept the water warm also. But I still think the greenhouse gases is, is a, uh, is, is still the dominant explanation. Um, if, if we had time, I would, I would take you through the actual temperatures uh, going all the way you know, from, from modern temperature records all the way back billions of years. I actually have the slides for that that I, that I did for a class on climate change, but uh, I don't think we're going to have the time. Um, yeah, let, let me know if you'd like to see those. Um, yeah, the final topic I was, I was saying, you know, impacts on exoplanets and beyond. I've, I've often tried to collect other... other uh, ways that, that insights from solar physics and heliophysics have actually uh, inspired you know, work in, in understanding phenomena in other fields of astrophysics. Um, I've just got two little examples here, one of which still is just a stellar physics example. There are some massive stars that have spectral features that recur as the star rotates and it's those features have been suspected to be due to things like corrotating, you know, spiral streams, corrotating interaction regions in the winds of these stars. I actually did some of my PhD thesis work a long time ago on, on hydrodynamic models of that. Um, yeah, trying to find, you know, relations to things that we see in the, in the, in the heliosphere. Uh, the other example is accretion disks, you know, not just around stars, but around, you know, black holes and active galactic nuclei. 
um, these things have a laundry list of plasma phenomena that looks very similar to what we see in theories of coronal heating, you know, turbulence, reconnection, you know, hot, you know, million degree coronas. Also, there are some collisionless regions above and below these things where the, the, you know, the ions and the electrons have different temperatures, much like we see in different parts of the solar wind. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting uh, parallels. And I think helio-inspired phenomena uh, is, is fair to say. All right, that brings us to the end. No, no, no reading for next week. Next week is the last class. I think we're aiming for some sort of, you know, open-ended discussion. Tom and I might have some, some things to present, but yeah, if you've got any remaining questions, speculations, crazy ideas, um, we can, we can talk about them. And yeah, that sort of is all I had.